Women of the antebellum period were much more concerned with being happy than previous women who continually had to struggle just to survive. Women were educated in schools and had a good understanding of the world so that they could teach their children. Women were only allowed in the domestic sphere, which included her home and the rearing of children, while men were involved in the social and business spheres. Women were not welcomed in most restaurants, clubs, theaters, and businesses, but they presided over the home, making it as comfortable and attractive as possible. A woman's class was tied solely to her husband's or father's profession. Women were expected to be completely reliant on her husband for emotional and financial support. Women were allowed, however, to be involved in religious affairs and were thought of as more spiritual than men. During this time period, women chose marriage partners in terms of romance and companionship rather than an economic partnership. Women had fewer children than that of the colonial period due to the right of refusal of sex. There were a few women who fought their way in, fought their way into the professions of doctor, minister, or journalist, but for the most part, women didn't interfere in the world of business. Several women became writers and found that they could make a living by writing novels, magazine articles, or books to help the housewife in her struggle for a comfortable, clean home. Teaching became a respectable career for women. In the past, only males were allowed to teach in schools, but once girls were allowed to go to public schools to be educated, there simply weren't enough male teachers. Women gladly stepped in to teach, even though they were paid considerably less money than male teachers. Many young women entered the factories to manufacture textiles. These young women became known as mill girls. They usually worked 12 hours a day. One third of the female factory workers went to night school to become teachers, artists, librarians, and missionaries. Most women who did not work in factories or as teachers were left to do piecework sewing in their homes or domestic service Domestic service was the least desirable job for women because the pay was so low and most women did not like working directly under the supervision of a demanding housewife. The women of this period were considered frail and often sickly. Illness such as malaria in the south and tuberculosis in the north and typhoid and cholera epidemics in the cities were common during this time period. Many young women were afflicted with tuberculosis and often lived with it for decades. Childbirth increased the danger of this illness. But doctors didn't advise women to avoid pregnancy. Doctors of this time period began treating puberty, menstruation, childbirth, and menopause as illnesses. Doctors seemed to think every problem a woman had started in the womb. Many women probably suffered from damage caused during childbirth. Unfortunately, doctors did not have the surgical skills needed or the anesthesia to help these women. J. Marion Sims was an Alabama doctor that practiced his surgical techniques without anesthesia on slave women, and after many attempts, finally devised an operation that helped some women. The botanical movement became popular during this time period along with other alternative treatments that prescribed exercise, sunlight, temperance, and sensible dress. Many people went to spas to recover from illnesses. The extremely tight and rigid corsets that women wore probably contributed to health problems such as shortness of breath and miscarriages, but women were so concerned about having a tiny waist that they continued to wear them anyway. The majority of black population were slaves in the southern states. About 80% of the slave women worked in the fields, plowing, hoeing, planting, and picking crops. They often worked 14 hours a day. They were also required to do a quota of spinning wool each day. This is all in addition to cleaning their houses and cooking for their families. Most slave women preferred working in the fields over domestic work because house slaves had no downtime and were always under the close watch of the mistress. Slaves were not allowed to learn to read or write. Slaves were not allowed to marry legally, but they usually had marriage ceremonies performed by ministers or owners. Husbands who worked on nearby plantations spent time with their families on Saturday nights and Sundays. The threat of being sold hung over every family. Many slave owners disapproved of breaking up families, but often tried to protect their slaves in their wills. But these wills were often ignored, and slaves were sold off to pay debts. Slave women who were considered to be naturally lusty were often raped by the, their masters, and many gave birth to mulatto babies. Masters seldom acknowledged their Ill illegitimate children, but the wives of these masters often became jealous and treated these slave women with contempt. Slave women did, did not run away very often because they were unwilling to leave their families, but the most famous runaway slave was a woman named Harriet Tubman. She ran away at age 30 when she heard that she was going to be sold. She made it to Philadelphia, where she worked and saved money. She returned to the South 19 times and smuggled many slaves to freedom in the North. She worked as a spy and a scout for the Union Army during the Civil War. She married after the war and took in orphans and elderly people who were homeless.
Inheritance and family identity in the Cherokee tribe was passed down through the females, but the tribe needed assistance from the new U.S. government after the Revolutionary War. There were Cherokee men who had been indoctrined to American views on women and property. To appear more civilized and to secure their property holdings, laws were made by these Cherokee men that changed the social structure of the Cherokee people. From this time forward, inheritance was passed through males. Women lost the political power they had previously held. Gender roles changed and men became the head of the household. In the spring of 1838, the Cherokee Nation was forced to leave their homes. They were put into internment camps where disease and illness killed the very young and old members of the tribe. In the late fall and winter, of the, the Cherokee people started the Long Move West, which would become known as the Trail of Tears. It is estimated that 4,000 Cherokee people died on this long journey due to starvation, illness, or cold. Women of this time period became involved in the social reform movements. Angelina and Sarah Grimke were sisters who were raised in the South and came from family of slaveholders. They moved to Philadelphia and were hired by the American Anti-Slavery Society as the first female abolitionist lecturers. They brought awareness to Northern men and women who had not, no exposure to slavery. Lydia Maria Child, who was famous for her frugal housewife book, wrote one of the first anti-slavery books in America. She argued not only for the end of slavery, but for the integration of all races. Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote the most popular novel of the 19th century, Uncle Tom's, Tom's Cabin. The novel was a powerful tool used to motivate and enlighten northern women on the evils of slavery. Sojourner Truth was an escaped slave who regularly saw visions in her voices which told her that she had a mission. She became a famous abolitionist lecturer who also spoke out about women's rights. Elizabeth Cady Stanton started the first movement for the rights of women calling for women to have the right to vote. Women in the antebellum period did not have much say in business or politics, but with determination and reform movements, northern women were able to make themselves heard by lecturing, writing books, getting petitions signed, and raising money for the anti-slavery movement and the beginning of the women's right movement. 